afternoon and welcome to our webinar on preparing for long COVID, COVID-19 and health system strengthening. Long COVID is an umbrella term for not recovering from COVID-19 symptoms for weeks and in many cases, months actually. But what are the symptoms? Is it just fatigue or are organs or even multiple organs affected from long COVID? Which part of the COVID-19 patients are affected from it? Only those which were hospitalized or also patients with mild COVID-19 that were never in hospital. How many are actually affected? What is the prevalence? And probably one of the most important questions, how can we, how can health system prepare and react to long COVID? My name is Matthias Wismar. I'm a program manager with the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies, and I'm today your facilitator. I will guide you through the program and the session. Our keynote speaker today is Dr. Nisrin Alban, University Hospital of Southampton. She has not only extensively researched long COVID, but she has become, in addition, a health campaigner, pushing amongst others for better surveillance of long COVID. Giving patients a voice is critical for a new condition like long COVID. And for this, uh, to, to this end, we have actually lined up quite a number of very interesting um, people helping to give patients a voice. And as keynote, as, as spotlight speakers, we have today with us Anna Kemp from the Spanish Long COVID Collective. And we have from Italy, Elisa Perego, a long COVID patient advocate from Italy. And you can follow both of them on uh, Twitter, but also can read the contributions in newspaper. And finally, as a spotlight speaker, we have Caroline Chu Graham from Keele University, who has conducted research on long COVID sufferers' experiences. Now, what are the aims of this, um, of this webinar? We want to understand, you know, do we need to monitor and surveil long COVID better? How can we actually adjust diagnosis and treatment guidelines? What sort of teams do we need to treat um, long COVID patient? Uh, is it necessary to acknowledge long COVID as an occupational disease? And how can we meet public expe expectations and communicate better? Just for the housekeeping, our time budget is very tight today, which is a challenge for all of the speakers. Just three things, please send us your questions and comments through the chat box. My colleague Erica will feed back the chat to us towards the end of the session. We are also going to record the video and we are planning to publish it later on on our YouTube channel. And finally, we will send you an evaluation form and we would kindly ask you to fill it in because it's quite important for us to see uh, about the quality of the webinars. This is actually the 16th installment of the webinar series. And I can only say stay tuned because next week we will discuss public-private partnerships for research and development in health care. So before we start with the keynote, I have to ask my colleague um, Erica Richardson to launch a poll on the topic. Erica, please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Just before we um, get stuck into the uh, uh, presentations, uh, we'd just like to do a quick poll. And Elisa, if you could put it up on the screen, that would be great. Um, and this is just to hear a bit, little bit from you uh, about your experience um, or an understanding of uh, long COVID. So first question, do you know personally anyone that is currently living with or suffering from long COVID? Um, and the second question is, what do you think are the most important measures to address long COVID? And for that one, you can have more than one answer. So you don't have to uh, limit yourself to more than sort of two or three options. But is the most important thing surveillance and monitoring? Is it research into the prevalence? Is it providing patient information? Is it developing new diagnostic and treatment guidelines? Or is it acknowledging it as an potentially as an occupational disease? Okay, and we'll give you the results of the poll after Nisreen's presentation. Thank you very much for your engagement. Thank you so much, Erica. And now it's uh, time for our keynote speaker, Nisreen. Please, uh, the floor is all yours. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me um, to give this talk. So uh, I'm um, um, basically Nisreen Alwan. I'm going to talk about uh, an overview of long COVID with a bit of uh, focus 
on the surveillance and the reporting uh, at the end um, and then hand over to uh, the wonderful uh, you know other spotlight speakers um, so um, the narrative of this pandemic has been a very much uh, black and white narrative so far so um, the narrative is um, basically in this pandemic has been you know black and white healthy or dead we now know this is not true and there's a bit in the middle which is the you know the gray bit people who are ill uh, and we know now that survival from COVID-19 infection does not necessarily mean recovery so my little bit about my story, uh, I got COVID-19 symptoms in March 2022 um, and come the summer with my public health and epidemiology hat on uh, and with me as a patient with my patient hat on because I haven't fully recovered from COVID-19 and I was having long COVID symptoms. I um, thought nobody's measuring uh, morbidity from COVID-19. Nobody's quantifying the illness caused by it, uh, particularly in those people who have not been admitted in hospital. So I started writing about it. Um, so in July, I wrote in the BMJ. In, in, in August, I wrote in Nature about it saying, well, a negative test, you know, following a positive test does not mean recovery. People who get discharged from hospital doesn't mean they're fully recovered uh, just because they've survived in the short term. And loads of people who are living uh, with long COVID, uh, you know, had the so-called mild infection at the start, but um, they're still suffering with it and we need to measure that. In September 2020, we had the first BMJ webinar on long COVID, where we talked about how to define it and how to uh, manage it. And since then, there's been lots of progress in terms of rec the recognition of long COVID, but we still have a long way to go. So what is long COVID? It's, as Mateo said, it's an umbrella term. It's basically not recovering from COVID-19 symptoms for several weeks or months. And people have been using different time cutoffs to decide when is, it doesn't move to long COVID. And we can, I can touch on that a bit, uh, a bit later. Um, not so just my, you know, if, even in the so-called mild COVID-19 cases, you know, like, like my case where I wasn't admitted to um, the hospital. It, it, it can be very debilitating, various degrees of severity and fatigue seems to be a common feature, but there is a wide range of symptoms. So uh, we did a, um, a, a patient, uh, you know, a survey, community-based survey online, uh, mainly through the long COVID support group and, you know, social media. And we focused it on people who were not hospitalized in the first two weeks of their illness. Um, and there were over 200, 200 uh, 5,000 participants, um, and mainly a female, but I think that's also a factor of, you know, the peer support group nature and the participation in the survey. And it was mainly focused in the UK, but we have some other countries. Um, the duration of the illness and survey was about um, uh, over seven months. So mostly first wave, um, you know, people were affected in the first wave. And 90% had good, very good or excellent health before infection. Um, and um, there were 47% um, pre-existing condition. And you can see the effect, there were 32 piece of people who said, 32% said they were unable to live alone without assistance in, the, in the six weeks from uh, the onset of illness. These are non-hospitalized people uh, at the start of their illness. 60% uh, took a median of 60 days time off sick, uh, about a third reported loss of income due to illness. Um, and the majority had symptoms affecting uh, three organ systems or more in, in the body. So it's not just a respiratory infection. And you can see here the most common symptoms and about a quarter said they were lab confirmed. Again, in the first wave of the pandemic uh, in the UK and um, many other countries, testing was not accessible to people who were, didn't get admitted to the hospital. Uh, but we compared those who had um, reported lab confirmation. And you can see they're quite similar. Exhaustion or fatigue is the most common, but the uh, concerning bit as well is that, that people were developing cognitive dysfunction. So, you know, memory problems, uh, loss of concentration, um, um, and confusion um, was, was, seems to be a feature. And um, then you can see what the other symptoms are. And these are the most common, but it's a really va wide variety of symptoms. Um, these are the clustering. There were two main clusters that emerged from this. And the majority of people, um, you know, had these uh, predominantly chest symptoms. So the chest uh, pressure, uh, the palpitations, the shortness of breath and cognitive dysfunction and the fatigue and muscle ache. Uh, but they seem to be uh, generally slightly improving over time. The min minority cluster, about 11%, uh, were, were more concerning because there seems to be, uh, so the, the top is the ongoing symptoms um, and the, the bottom is the where they started the acute symptoms in the first two weeks of illness. And they, you know, don't seem to be improving in the, and their multi-system involvement seems to be quite 
um, severe. How common is it? Well, long COVID, the variables um, really, uh, you know, uh, you know the, uh, the variable estimates. Um, uh, it's very common, we know from studies in those who were hospitalized, but, uh, and we know those who um, were hospitalized also, you know, there's some study concerning um, findings about one in three readmitted within a few months of discharge and one in eight actually died. Um, in the mild, moderate initial disease, the estimate varies between 10 to 50% uh, of having at least one symptoms a few months after uh, with varying degrees of severity. And um, there's little data in children. Some are emerging from the Office of National Statistics within, you know, of continuing symptoms within a few weeks, but we definitely need more on that. It's difficult to accurately measure the prevalence because of the relapsing nature uh, of the illness, which is a very uh, common feature. It comes and goes and fluctuate because of, you know, lots of people, as I said, lack of lab confirmation at the start of the illness. And also, who do you follow up? So the representativeness of the sample. Um, the uh, potential mechanisms are here. I won't go in detail into, that, into them, but basically we still don't know exactly what's the underlying mechanism and, and, and whether you know, people can have multiple mechanisms uh, underlying it. So it could be there are different groups. So you know, post-intensive care, people with organ damage, uh, uh, you know, continuing symptoms, and all of these are not mutually exclusive and we need more research to uh, underline those. Um, obviously, post-viral fatigue is not a new condition, um, and uh, we've seen it. We've seen it with other viruses where people don't recover for months, um, and that could be um, similar to what's happening in some long COVID patients. And the same goes with, you know, ME and CFS. Um, these are areas which have been largely neglected in medical research. And um, the two points to say about that: one is, is, is too early to kind of classify long COVID under, you know, the, these, um, you know, pre-existing conditions umbrella. But also, research into long COVID would uh, definitely, uh, in my view, would benefit all of these conditions that need um, a very um, urgent attention. Uh, in terms of definitions, uh, there have been definitions from in, in the UK from the National Institute of Clinical Excellence um, and you know equivalent in Scotland and the Royal College of Physicians. And basically they put timelines in terms of what's acute up to four weeks, what's ongoing four to 12 weeks and what ter they termed as post-COVID syndrome, which is more than 12 weeks. But the symptoms are very variable. So there's still variation in terms of diagnosis of what falls under this umbrella of, you know, of these timelines. I mean, what the one thing that we suggested is maybe to try and ascertain the acute infection in the first two weeks by asking about uh, lab confirmation, but also about symptoms and where you were when you had the symptoms, whether you had contact with people if you didn't have a test um, who were tested or whether you were in high prevalence area. Um, so we need some sort of a systematic way to measure um, the infection when we don't have the lab confirmation that would be inclusive and non discriminatory with no discrimination against uh, people. Priorities uh, for long COVID uh, has been highlighted in the first parliamentary debate on long COVID in, in the UK are the three, three things really reporting, recognition and research. Um, no, uh, there's no, it's not controversial that we need a, a huge amount of research in long COVID. And I think recognition will also be touched on by the other speakers. I'm just going to talk in the next couple of minutes about um, the reporting bit, which we uh, called counting long COVID. Um, so there was, you know, we've got, you know, hashtag counting long COVID has been uh, really trending on social media uh, for, for a few months uh, now since we started in, in, you know, around September time. Um, and what, what do we mean by it? It means uh, following up people with COVID-19 infections, so clinical and lab confirmed uh, people, you know, and asking them whether they've recovered covered at certain time points, four or eight or 12 weeks from infection, um, and, 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 and trying to track that in a surveillance system, so not only uh, for research purposes. Um, and, um, but also patient registries are important. So people accessing primary care needs to go on some registries um, as part of surveillance because we need some universal inclusive diagnostic criteria and case definitions. And we need to reduce the variation in accessing support care and diagnostic uh, services. Um, we need proper coding in electronic health systems to allow us to do that. Um, so what do we want to uh, report? Um, so as we most countries in the world are reporting daily, you know, case numbers, 
uh, deaths and hospital admissions from COVID, we need illness statistics. We need to know the proportion of people who have not recovered within a few you know, weeks of the infections. We need to know the proportion of people with complication and organ damage following COVID-19 infection. We need to know who gets readmitted to hospital after discharge and actually who gets admitted to hospital later in the illness. Um, and we need to um, know the, the proportion of work. So the loss of productivity due to long COVID or COVID complication. And also we need to know the proportion recovered from long COVID because some people do recover and, and we need to track that and understand the, um, what are the predictors of this. In terms of prevention of long COVID, it goes without saying that the most effective is primary prevention. So that's preventing acute infection. So that's suppressing the infection as much as possible. And we, now we've got the vaccination, but obviously using the non-pharmacological interventions. We need to research to know what prevents progression from the acute stage to long COVID in terms of treatments and other interventions. And the tertiary prevention is to prevent complications and disability when you have long COVID and improve quality of life. Um, is long COVID the great equalizer? When COVID came, they said, oh, anybody could get infected. It's an equalizer in terms of socioeconomic inequality. Well, it's not, and long COVID is not too, because people who are more likely to get infected, uh, more likely to get exposed, and they're more likely to get long COVID, less likely to get sick pay and uh, lose income, um, and less likely to get adequate rest and, and compensation. So it's a vicious cycle in terms of health inequalities. Um, the last thing to say, which really ties in with the next of the speakers, is that patients are central to defining long COVID. They know a lot about it now, and we need to listen to them in terms of what we call um, the condition and what do we do about it. Um, and I think that ties in with the next speakers. Thank you very much for that. Thank you so much, Nisrin. I think that was a great overview on the situation and what we know about it for the for the time being. And of course, uh, you've asked for much more research, but at the same time, we need a very strong health system response. And looking into what you reported on income loss, for example, it's not only a health uh, system response, it's even a welfare state response, as almost the entire COVID-19 uh, pandemic has been. Thank you so much for this great overview. And before we go to our spotlight speakers, Erica and Annalisa, can you please uh, present the results of the poll? So, yes, exciting results. Um, I was quite surprised by this, but less than half of the people uh, in the audience know some personally know someone who is uh, living with long COVID. Um, I was quite surprised by that, but that's probably because so many of my friends and colleagues have been exposed to COVID and many of them are still experiencing side effects. But with the importance of different measures to address long COVID, um, surveillance and monitoring comes out at a big, you know, that's the thing that people uh, want to uh, feel is most important. Um, and then uh, uh, with then research, um, new diagnostic treatment guidelines uh, coming in sort of shortly behind that. So thank you very much for that. Questions in the chat box, please. We welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we can pick up these results later on when we have the panel discussion round and uh, go back to them. But now it's my great pleasure to give patients and their representatives um, a voice. And as the first spotlight speaker, I would like to ask Anna Kemp to come in. And uh, the floor is all yours, Anna. Hello, uh, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm Anna Kemp. Um, I represent the Spanish Long COVID Collective, Long COVID Acts. Um, and I'm going to talk about how we've harnessed the unusually rich and varied skill set of the Long COVID community, which because of the pandemic includes a large number of health professionals in order to tackle the challenges we faced as a patient body uh, in Spain. I'm going to kick off with a quick snapshot of the pandemic pan, uh, uh, backdrop in Spain. As you know, the country was hit early and it was hit hard and the resources weren't quite in place to deal with the tsunami that enveloped the country. As a result, um, the long COVID community has faced months of incomprehension, um, their symptoms misunderstood or put down um, to anxiety. And because the government, um, and despite government recognition in January uh, this year, we still find ourselves in um, a statistical no man's land between COVID deaths and recoveries. 
Um, and it's essentially this feeling of isolation of um, not quite existing that has spurred the long COVID patient community to action in Spain um, and obviously the world over. Long COVID Act then um, is an alliance of an ever growing number of regional long COVID patient collectives in Spain. As a structure, it mirrors the political and healthcare setup in Spain, and it enables us to work together on both a local and a national level to redefine the narrative around long COVID. As a collective, we've used a three prong approach um, using the wealth of first hand patient experience available from our community. Um, the know how of expert patients, those health workers, scientists, researchers with long COVID. And because we knew we were facing a monumental task to turn the tide in favor of the patient, we decided early on to adopt a pragmatic rather than a political approach by teaming up with this Sp Spanish Society of General and Family Medicine, which is known as the SEM in Spain. Together, we've adopted a dual strategy. Um, firstly, we're walk working towards a multidisciplinary one-stop shop model for long COVID care, which is flexible, collaborative, and holistic in approach. And it um, would place the primary care doctor and the patient at the center of a kind of octopus of specialist care. This model takes full advantage of Spain's extremely ext extensive and consolidated state controlled primary health care system, and it would alleviate the need to create long COVID units in hospitals that in all likelihood wouldn't be able to cope with the potentially huge numbers of long COVID patients that are heading their way. It also represents a unique opportunity to take advantage of the challenges of a new illness in order to rethink the primary care model from scratch. And although uh, this model is a long way off, um, we've taken our first significant steps towards achieving it um, with a comprehensive clinical guide to long COVID for the Spanish government, which is going to draw on the input of more than 27 Spanish medical societies, and which we hope will pave the way for our patient-centered octopus uh, once, more once more is known about the virus. Secondly, we've been working hard to raise awareness of long COVID among the public, politicians and healthcare providers to correct um, some of the injustices suffered by long haulers uh, um, and to improve patients' quality of life uh, with the tools that are available now. Um, as a collective, we've also fought uh, very hard on behalf of the thousands of long haulers in Spain um, from the first wave of the pandemic who didn't have proper access to PCR testing when they first got sick and as a result have struggled to be taken seriously by doctors ever since. Um, using data that we gathered during a survey that we carried out between July and October last year, um, we are able to show that it is in fact possible to diagnose COVID-19 clinically as you can a virus like the flu. Um, and when the Spanish government recognized long COVID for the first time in January, this fact was at long last uh, reflected in their definition of long COVID. We've um, also created a patient-led research team, um, a mixed bag of scientists and healthcare professionals from the collective who are using data gathered from our members to better understand a whole range of topics like uh, symptom cl clusters, vaccines, cellular immunity. And they're pooling their expertise um, in order to encourage further research into the, the hypothesis of viral persistence as a cause of long COVID, for example. They recently published a rationale in support of this theory, which draws, among other things, on the lessons learnt by vets working with feline coronaviruses. I'd like to finish with the words of Dr. To Lorenzo Armenteros of the SEM, who says of our project, normally the patient's role is to back up what the doctor already knows. Working in parallel, elbow to elbow with the patients has been one of the most enriching collaborative experiences I've known, not just personally, but for society. 
And I think it's uncomfortable, disconcerting, and at times downright scary as patients to find ourselves ahead of the wave. But the long COVID community has a unique skill set, and this means we're perfectly positioned to ensure that long COVID is properly understood, rigorously defined, and soon, we hope, effectively treated. Thank you. Anna, thank you so much for this excellent intervention. And listening to you, it's so obvious what an eminent role actually civil society and civil society organizations play in the development and improvement of health systems because it's it's the people that can help shape the policies help inform the experts the medical experts and so on and we should also say that uh, civil society is not just growing on trees you know it needs to have uh, actually context conducive to to engage and work and i think it's not very easy for you at the moment and for your colleagues uh, and uh, you built this all uh, so to say on the fly while suffering from COVID, but also while the pandemic is evolving thank you so much and um, mm -hmm. i would like to move on to our second um, keynote speaker elisa uh, spotlight speaker elisa please the floor is all yours I would like uh, to speak uh, about uh, how the long COVID movement uh, and the idea of long COVID uh, as an illness emerged. And um, my intervention takes uh, the title from a paper which I wrote uh, with uh, Professor Felice Kallar from the University of Glasgow, How and Why Patient Made Long COVID. Next slide, please. And this is uh, the, the paper, basically, for those who are, uh, in, might be interested in reading it, published in Social Science and Medicine last uh, autumn. Next slide, please. The, um, the paper documents the rise of long COVID as a movement and uh, the creation of uh, basically this condition by patient in a way. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, we had uh, this idea, these public messages that uh, basically recovery from COVID-19 was going to take two to six weeks. But uh, this was not the case. People was not, were not recovering and started to share online and through different uh, um, media, such as through intervention, uh, in, like uh, giving interviews to newspapers uh, and so on, that uh, uh, COVID was longer and had more symptoms than initially told. It was a condition which affected several organs, which was much wider than we were thinking at the beginning. So people who had COVID-19 created the long COVID because through this sharing, the persistence of this illness um, went through social media, where patients were sharing information through other, channel, other uh, health and policy channels. Uh, long COVID was created as a hashtag, basically, in a single tweet in May 2020. And people started to use this hashtag and uh, it basically went viral and uh, patients from different uh, uh, countries, such as Spain and France and so on, started to coalitions around the use of this term, long COVID, which then started to be used by medical professionals, um, policymakers, politicians, and so on, Next slide, please. And uh, the recognition and consolidation of the use of the term long COVID basically happened to place at the speed of light. Long COVID was used for the first time on social media on the 20th of May 
2020. And basically, three months later, there was the first meeting of the World Health Organization on the first, 21st of August, in which uh, the term long COVID was used and uh, formal recognition of the existence of this condition took place. And this is a, a phenomenon which is, uh, I would say, unique in the history of medicine. The fact that uh, an illness which didn't exist came to be recognized across the world so fast. And this brings us to the knowledge that uh, patient expertise uh, and patient knowledge of this condition must be incorporated into the pandemic evidence base. Next slide, please. And uh, basically, as uh, patients, uh, as uh, researchers, as public health uh, policymakers, uh, what we have to fight for in view of this huge contribution by patients to public knowledge. And uh, I argue that we have to fight for building innovative interdisciplinary collaboration between policymakers, patients, uh, healthcare providers, uh, governments, collaborations which are also supposed to be ethical as well in terms of the exploitation and the use of uh, data provided by patients, uh, the labor of patients advocates, and so on. Next slide. And basically what uh, was uh, basically a few patients sharing their experience of illness through social media, through face Facebook support group, basically it has become an international movement, grassroots movement, which is now basically a global network, which is involving organizations such as the World Health Organization. And this is a really a sort of a miracle for me and something in which we have to build on. Next slide, please. And uh, myself, uh, I'm involved in different uh, research projects uh, and uh, advocacy projects, uh, including uh, in Italy through the project Long COVID Italy, Long COVID Italia. And we are working um, for the recognition of Long COVID in Italy and the Italian government through our intervention and the intervention of uh, advocates like us have started to use long COVID now. Thank you very much for inviting me and for listening to my presentation. Lisa, thank you so much for this great presentation. I think there was a lot of, a lot of things echoing what uh, we heard from Anna, but uh, there are a couple of things which I would like to uh, underline again. According to what you said, it was extremely useful to have long COVID as a term established relatively early so that all these diverse um, symptoms actually can come under this umbrella term, as yes. uh, Nisreen mentioned it. And the other thing is, and I think that is uh, the, the case for the whole pandemic and how we deal with it, the speed of knowledge development and how the knowledge actually evolves and then feeds back into it. It's quite amazing. And it's very difficult actually to keep pace with all this. And of course, for professionals, but also for patients. And then, um, interestingly enough, and I, I think I'm, I'm very grateful for this, you not only mentioned, you know, you work in your country, but uh, that it is a movement and it's not just a national movement, but it's rather an international movement in the meantime, and that patients, patient organizations are connecting with each other to, to move on on the long curve. So, Elisa, thank you so much for this um, presentation. Thank you. And I would like now to ask, um, Carolyn to uh, take the floor and um, tell us a little bit about her research, her interviews uh, and the experience of a patient with long COVID patient. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak today and thank you everybody for attending. 
I'm going to talk about a story uh, which resonates very much with um, all the previous speakers. And that's about witnessing the emergence of a new condition, long, which we now call long COVID. I'm a GP or family uh, medicine doctor, family physician, but I'm also a researcher in um, primary care research. So um, COVID-19 at the beginning of last year, as, as everybody said already, was thought to be either um, a, a respiratory illness which caused respiratory dysfunction but recovery through to multi-organ failure and death. In general practice or family medicine, we changed the way we worked. We started to move to remote consulting. We felt we were dealing with a, an increased workload, much more uncertainty managing a lot of risk. And while we were adapting the way we worked, we started to notice as GPs, family physicians, that some people who, who had had COVID-19, whether or not tested by PCR or antibody testing, were, were presenting to us by telephone, um, saying that they were suffering persistent symptoms, chest pain, palpitations, muscle and joint pains, headaches, People were talking about cognitive problems, brain fog, neurological symptoms, and fatigue. Fatigue being a particularly important problem. And so around May 2020, I became aware of this as a GP, was talking to people with the symptoms, but also on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, was aware that there was this big media presence. People who were feeling unheard, people who were having these symptoms, but actually not knowing what was going on, but also uh, not perhaps being heard by their general practitioners. And during this time, um, long COVID came to be a term. So at PACE, I scrambled a research team spoke to a number of people who had long COVID, we call that patient public involvement and engagement. They helped me put together an ethics application that went to Keele University um, and we got ethics approval. And you can see from the poster here that the original title of the study was sequelae of COVID-19, people's experiences of the medium term effects of COVID or suspected COVID infection. So these documents were all put together before long COVID had actually been labelled and, and was in widespread use. And I'm going to present very briefly the results of this study. So as I've said, we got ethics approval and we had a lot of advice and input from people with long COVID into the study documents, into our posters, our advertisements, our topic guide. And we conducted interviews either on the telephone or, or on um, online using Microsoft Teams or Zoom. And these were conducted last July and August. We recorded the interviews and then transcribed and analyzed them. And then we went back to both participants in the interviews, but also our patient groups to discuss the findings and think about what they meant, think about how to present them and think about the implications. So we conducted 30 interviews in total. Uh, and the, interesting, the mean length of the interviews was around um, 80 minutes. So these were long interviews. And there, are, there were four main themes that I'm going to pull out for, for today. One is the hard and heavy work of managing uh, the symptoms. So this participant says, I really have to pace myself. I have to do a chore, sit down, then do the next chore. It's like peeling potatoes. I can't peel the carrots straight afterwards. And that really illustrates the difficulties that people were having um, with just managing their daily activities. There was a lot of fear and uncertainty expressed in all the interviews. So this participant says, my main fear is that the virus, well, it's not new, but I hope it's not something that's in my body and it will reactivate when I overdo any activity. People were concerned about not being heard by their GPs. They didn't feel that they were being believed. They were not being investigated. Remember people were being consulted either online or um, through the telephone or possibly video consultations. And many patients, many people who we interviewed said, I've not even been examined. 
And we felt that finding the right GP was really important for people. So this participant says she just listens a little bit more to what I'm saying. And she's much more willing to say, of course, we don't really know what's going on because it's a new disease. So this uncertainty um, that patients were experiencing, it was actually OK for them to hear that uncertainty from practitioners as long as, long as their symptoms were believed. And all the people we spoke to said, what we need is we need to be investigated. We need to be examined. We need to have ex um, pathology, real pathology excluded. So this participant said, what I want is to have my body checked to reassure me there's no long-term damage. I want some monitoring because we don't know what the virus can do to your body. This research was unfunded, but we think we've had quite a lot of impact. So we've got publications, um, we've raised awareness, therefore, to the primary care community of long COVID and the importance that the primary care physician, the general practitioner, plays in managing and supporting people with long COVID. We contributed to the NICE guidelines. We've worked with the Royal College of General Practitioners to, in England and UK to develop top tips for managing long COVID and to develop a learning module. We've also highlighted the fact that long COVID can occur in children. And I've appeared on a number of, of webinars, some with Ms. Reen, um, and one that is free to watch is the RSM webinar. And I think what's the most important thing, I think from my perspective as a GP, is that we're influencing commissioning. So we are thinking this, this work is contributing to how services are set up um, nationally to manage people with long COVID. So what next? Well, I think we've achieved what we set out to do, which was raise awareness amongst primary care physicians of long COVID. And we've legitimised the problems that people with long COVID have, which we've heard from other speakers has been difficult. We're influencing commissioning and practice, but there's lots more research that needs doing. So people who didn't tell their story, clinicians' perspectives, and importantly, defining the epidemiology of long COVID and developing testing and then getting out there person-centered interventions for people with long COVID. Thank you very much for listening. Caroline, thank you so much for this presentation. That was really very interesting. And I, has, I, I think it clearly demonstrated the value of interviews and um, uh, qualitative research. And I think you have captured in a, a sometimes actually terrifying way you know the concerns and worries of these people not just about the functionality the body the the, the physical functionality but also the worries and the, and the threats and you can figure you know uh, what 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 it makes what it uh, makes with people with regards to uh, mental health thank you so much for sharing some of these original voices and uh, now we'll turn back to the chat box and to the input coming from all the participants and erica i would like to ask you to uh, um, tell us a little bit about what we have received and feed it back to our speakers. Hello there. Um, so quite a lot of uh, activities in the chat box, some really useful resources being shared um, around. So some nice interaction there. But there are also some questions which I need to ask you. So uh, one for all the panelists is about uh, whether or not this is so much a health issue or is it a much broader issue than that? Um, so is there a role for social workers in the integrated care models that you've been presented, these sort of um, multidisciplinary models you've presented? Um, is, should we be working with sort of unions, employers, things like this, seeing as it has such a strong impact on uh, work and uh, work as well? Um, couple of more clinical questions, probably uh, more for Nazreen and uh, Carolyn, but, um, do we know anything about the risk of long COVID uh, and how it relates to the new variants that have uh, emerged over the last few months? Um, and what would be the best treatment models? Do we not actually know anything about how best to treat uh, uh, long COVID? Um, and also a more statistical question, which I'm not sure we'll be able to answer, but is do we know what proportion of people who get uh, coronavirus go on to develop long COVID? So just to start off with some broad questions. Okay. Shall I start? I'll start with the last one. Yes, please, Nazreen. That's, that's great. The, the proportion, I think the question in terms, so the, the challenges that I said about measuring the prevalence is um, 
um, um, there are many challenges, uh, but there have been studies where they followed up people who have tested positive, a pool of people who have tested positive, including asymptomatic people, and they saw how many developed uh, long COVID. Um, some studies from a lot around the world put these estimates as something, you know, at, 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 you know, two to three weeks, you know, one in three, you know, a bit later, um, you know, um, maybe one in four or, you know, one in five. Uh, we've got the, I think the largest estimates come from the Office of National Statistics in the UK because they have a random population sample uh, for prevalence of COVID-19 where they, uh, you know, frequently sample people in this random sample and they found that they've estimated from there sample that there's one in 10 who have um, some symptoms of long COVID uh, th uh, three, 12 weeks um, after uh, testing positive. Um, but they uh, only asked about a limited number of symptoms because these are the questions they routinely ask about in every, um, uh, uh, you know, in every wave of their uh, symptoms. So, so that, yes, I mean, we know it's common, to be honest. So, so, so we now know we have much more data than we did a few months ago, um, and it is common enough. Um, and um, even one in, you know, one in 10 is still, you know, given the rates of infection we see around the world is, is huge. What happens after and who recovers from long COVID and who becomes worse and who, you know, all of that needs more research because it's not, it's just one point in time. Yeah. So do you want me to go on for the other questions? or so Maybe we just have a round and uh, ask uh, Anna, Elisa and Caroline and then we have a second round. Yeah. Anna, just pick out the question which you feel you're best suited to respond to. Me? Yeah. Yes. Um, I was thinking more, I was just thinking now about the kind of um, the question about the social context uh, and whether we can invo involve social workers and things. I think, for example, in Spain, um, the doctor, there is an element to the treatment already that takes in, into account the socio democratic side because the doctor controls your whether you are, um, I, I'm missing a bit of vocabulary actually, but like whether you are um, on sick pay or not. Um, and I think in general, um, it's vital that long COVID is situated within a context because even though we don't know exactly how to treat it at the moment, there's a tendency to be sent off down. If you like my octopus, you'd be sent off down a, a kind of a branch of the octopus. And yet the uh, lung doctor doesn't talk to the heart doctor and you may have a lung test on a particularly good day and that's you ticked off. And I think it's very, very important that we broaden the context and that we bring in the fact that, you know, a lot of people are at the peak of their professional life. And if we're talking about huge numbers in their forties, huge numbers of women with children in their forties, we're looking maybe at a change of how people work and uh, you you can't just go and see a doctor in isolation who treats a symptom and yet we can start treating symptoms if we take a bit more context into into account and i thank you so much for this in our in our regular health systems life erica and me we talk all the time about um, care integration actually and multimorbidity and again here we have a very a test case or a very important case of this and we see to what extent our health systems will actually respond or fail you know if they don't integrate. Elisa please. I have to say that uh, I'm in Lombardy in Italy and the situation is really difficult for long COVID because uh, I almost don't know how to describe it, but both my COVID-19 and my long COVID have been life-threatening, basically. And it's really difficult. I didn't receive any care, basically, even like uh, basic stuff like oxygen. My oxygen is still dropping to life-threatening levels. And... Uh, it's totally, there is like uh, a total disregard for, uh, for, for the severity of this condition. I personally, I personally don't know almost anyone who has uh, proper care. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I went to the hospital for suspected uh, thrombotic event, and this was in month 11, they started to tell me it was anxiety. And uh, there is uh, a situation which is really complicated. There is no vast recognition among healthcare professionals here. And I think there is a lot of political negationism 
about this in Italy. Although, yes, we, we reach, uh, basically, we push the, 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 the Ministry of Health to recognize it publicly, but then the government changed. And literally, it's, uh, it's really difficult to have medical professional to help. And um, it, it, it is really something we need to build an understanding of the condition. And uh, uh, it's, it's really most people I know don't have any care. Uh, they, they can uh, take a time out of work. Um, on sick leave or something, but uh, it's not something which is really entrenched uh, into the situation, into policy. And also different regions in Italy have different, um, you know, like regional governments. So it's really uh, uh, complicated to have uh, guidelines which are valid uh, for everyone and for uh, different regions. And uh, yeah, I've been given a diagnosis of post-COVID syndrome at the hospital. But um, so they are aware that there is this condition, they know about it, but it's really difficult to get uh, any treatment uh, and any support uh, and the anxiety, the, the Diagnosis uh, is really <laughs> quite prevalent. Sorry, I have trouble to speak uh, even now because I have uh, uh, respiratory problems, quite serious. And uh, it, is, it is really difficult. We really need uh, a lot of push and a lot of support uh, from the international community for this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elisa. And I think from what you're saying, it's very, very clear that there are still large care gaps, but not just the care itself. It's also the legal frameworks which need to adopt quite uh, quickly. And probably we don't have in many countries proper uh, policies actually that uh, can um, support all of this. And I see that everybody wants to speak now very quickly, Nizreen and then Carolyn. Yes, very quickly on the two questions, um, Erica, so, and they tie in together. Uh, about the social, the, the wider, you know, the social role and the treatment. I, I think this is really important because, so we don't really know what works. This is the secondary prevention bit that I discussed, you know, what, you know, what works in terms of preventing progression. Although many people are saying you need adequate rest, at least, you know, when you have your acute infection, you need to rest, um, um, uh, you know, during the recovery phase. And we know this is not possible for people uh, who are on low incomes, who have to go back to work, who can't get a long time of uh, sick pay, you know, frontline key workers, carers, you know, people, you know, parents looking at children. So obviously, um, you know, this will widen the inequality. So definitely, um, um, it is a, a wider system, welfare, you know, social um, issue as well. And we need to start, and the way we start um, to look at that seriously and uh, or is, is to quantify it, to say, well, this is the, imp this is what it is. And this is what the impact that it's likely to gonna, it's going to have on uh, all sorts of walks of life. Um, so that's taken seriously. Thank you, Nisman. Carolyn? Hey, two points. One is um, I really like the octopus, and I think that's signifying a, a multidisciplinary team with information flow and people talking to each other is really important. And, and in some parts of the UK, we are developing long COVID clinics, multidisciplinary clinics, and I think it's, it's important that we press on with that work and share the work. I think a lot of um, localities are developing their um, clinics in isolation and not sharing good practice, which is a shame. Um, I'm certainly going to share the octopus with, with the, our commissioners. I think the other thing about work is really important because I think, you know, we, we said this is going to have a tremendous economic benefit uh, problem on the individuals, but also on society. I think there's a, there's a problem in, in general practice at the moment in that patients are requesting their fit notes or sick notes online or by telephone. So again, they're not having the face-to-face -face interaction. And perhaps the, the GP is not in a position to give advice about work, but is just giving a fit note or a, a sick note. 
Um, and you know whether there's a role for an intermediary or somebody in a, a multidisciplinary clinic or a case manager to actually work with a person who's out of work or who's, who's not working because they're off sick to get them back into work. Because I think there's a big gap between the, the person sitting at home, getting a fit note, being off sick and not having any way back. And I guess there's, in addition to that, there's also lots of information that needs to go to employers and line managers because perhaps they don't understand what long COVID is either. Thank you so much. Anna, can we bring you in before we ask Nesrin to wrap up with us this session? Very briefly, Anna. Hi. Um, I, I just feel like that... Um, reiterating what I said at the end of my presentation in that the we are a unique quite unique um, patient body I think in that there are such huge numbers of us all ill at the same time and because it does affect a lot of health workers and uh, all sorts of other people with different skills I think it would be wonderful if out of all this kind of new models were born or we were able to help those other communities that haven't had enough research you know and I kind of feel like um, without just to sort of snatch a bit of positivity out of our situation um, it's kind of what I cling to really Okay, thank you so much, Anna. <clears throat> and uh, the last word for today, Nizreen, that's uh, you are just very, very briefly to wrap up the session. Yeah, a great session uh, with everybody. I mean, I think what Anna just uh, what just Anna, Anna just said. I think we can turn this into something positive. We don't know a lot about what's going on in long COVID. We need to do research. We need to do a lot, but also we need to think. Um, this is um, if we get this right and pay enough attention to um, illness that will benefit lots of other people with chronic illnesses who've been uh, neglected and it will benefit what we do for what you know any following pandemic uh, in the future so we need to get the long long COVID right um, and um, hopefully we can a bit now we've gone a long way but we've still got a long to go that's a bit the attitude we try to convey, you know, what can we actually learn from the COVID-19 responses for health system strengthening and resilience of uh, the health system in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all our speakers, panelists, Erica, thank you, and Annalisa as well. And we hope to see you back next week when we talk about private-public private partnerships. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye.